Well, there's a famous scene in the movie Young Guns, starring Emilio Estevez as Billy the Kid, in which Billy's posse is starting to question whether they should continue in their quest or not. They were on a mission, but they were starting to suffer. They were taking some hits. And so they were wondering, should we continue on this course or abandon it? And in that moment, Billy the Kid gives them an inspirational speech. He tells them a story. And he says, three men were playing cards. And as they're playing cards, someone burst through the door and told them, judgment is at hand. The end of the world has come. And when they heard that news, the first man said, well, then I'm going to a saloon. And I'm going to spend all my money to, to have whatever experiences I can have before time runs out. And the second man said, I'm going to church to pray. And the third one said, I shall finish the game. And then the camera zoomed in on Emilio Estevez's face. He said, I shall finish the game. Which clearly feels like the right answer. But you go, what does that mean? What he's talking about there is when you think about the end of the world, that history comes to an end, or you think about the end of your own life, you realize the end is coming. How do people respond? Some people say, I want to have as many sensual experiences as I can, moral, immoral, whatever. I have a bucket list of things I want to do before I kick the bucket. I got to go do those things. The second group says, I've already done a lot of things. And if I'm going to face God, I've got some things to apologize for. And uh, to confess, I got to get my heart right before I meet my maker, right? But the third one says, everything I'm doing now is exactly what I want to be doing when the end comes. And that is an impressive answer. When you think about the end of your life, what do you want to be true of you? Can you say, everything I'm doing now is exactly what I want to be doing when the end comes? I mention all that because we're reading this passage in Peter, and as he's coming towards the end of the book, did you notice there's a lot of time references? The end of all time is at hand. Live the rest of your time on earth in this particular way. The one who's ready to judge the living and the dead stands ready that, that history is going someplace. It's not a circle, it's a story. And that story has an ending point. And what do you want to be true of your life when the end comes? Uh, I remember I had a mentor that um, I, I've told him, hey, you're my mentor, but I quote your wife more. Because I remember she said something to me once. This little diminutive woman looked at me and she said, you know, when I was young, she said, and someone died tragically, it always hit me like a shock. She said that I would go, what am I worried about? Suddenly in the face of death, so many of the things I thought were important or I was concerned about just seemed so shallow and hollow. And I'm like, what am I living for? She said, but now as I look at my life and see what I'm doing, since God had gotten a hold of her heart and she's ministering, she says, now whenever I see the face of death in my story, I go, what I'm doing now has never been more important. And I want that for you, that you could come to the end and be a mix of two and three. I'm gonna pray, but what I'm doing now is exactly what I wanna be doing when the end comes. Uh, when I uh, played football in high school, we would do this drill called two minute O two-minute offense. And you would play it to say, how do we want to play the game when we know the clock's about to run out? And you wouldn't panic, because if you panic, that doesn't make you better at the game. And you wouldn't suddenly play a different game. Suddenly you switch to soccer. You're still playing football, but what happens is you eliminate the extraneous and you excel at the essential. When I know the ending is coming, let me run from the huddle to the, to the line. Let me, let me cut out any extraneous movement and let me just get great at what's essential for this game. And that's what Peter's gonna tell us here. You wanna live in a way where you're ready when history comes to the end. Uh, when I was training for football, I remember we had a coach, uh, Davis, that in training, he would make us run uh, four 400 yard dashes, sprints. If you know 400 yards, one loop around the track, I don't know why they call it a dash or a sprint. It's not that. To run all the way around, 100 yards a dash. 400 is a means of torture. Like, this isn't right. Uh, but we would do it, and he would make us go out there and run four in a row uh, sprints as fast as you can. And I remember he would have us do the first one, and we'd come in huffing the second one and the third one. And by the third one, we were all leaned over. Some guys are throwing up. We're all feeling terrible. And we're like, man, I just want to coast out the last one and get out of here. And it was in that moment that Coach Davis would look at us and go, men, I know you're tired. I know you're hurting. But this fourth lap is like the fourth quarter of a game. What do you want to be true of you at the end of the game? 
You want to think about how much pain you're in, how much suffering you're in, the other team's suffering too. Or do you want to push past that suffering? And do you want to band together and accomplish the goal for which you were on that field? What do you want to be true of you when life gets hard in the fourth quarter? And he wouldn't yell, he wasn't a yeller. But the more he would say that to us, what do you want to be true of you? You're like, yeah, I don't want to quit. I don't want to be a cry-cry. I want to do something significant. And by the end of it, he was like, so are you ready? Then get on the line. We're like, okay, I want to make a difference. And he would tell us to go. We're like, ah, we get our fastest times. Because I want to sprint to the end. I want to live differently when I know the end is coming. And here Peter's going to look at us and say, hey, history is going someplace and we're in the last days. What he means by it is on God's redemptive plan, there's only one more date on the calendar. That is the day Jesus comes to consummate history. If you read your Bible, at the very beginning, you get the creation of the world. You get the fall of man. You get God establish a, a rescue mission that's through a certain people group. I'm going to bring a hero who will make things right. God establishes those people, sets them free from slavery, puts them in a land, gives them a law to obey him. And you get the established of this people meant to be a kingdom of priests to the world. He gives them a worship book like Psalms and wisdom like Proverbs. They could live a life that honors God so people would be drawn to them as they disobey the prophets, warn them. We're meant to be a light and a beacon to the world. Repent and be ready for God's hero to arrive. And then you get into the gospels and four times through the gospels, you get these different pictures of the hero. The king has come to rescue us, to live the perfect life. We could not die the death we deserve, resurrect from the grave to give us hope. And at the end of that, he establishes a church, and that's where we are. There's only one book left, the book where Jesus returns and shuts down history. We're in the last days. How do you want to live knowing the clock will run out? Peter's going to give us three things, and I'll tell you what they are ahead of time. He's going to tell us, at the end, here's what you want to be true of you. You want to bury sin. You want to endure slander, and you want to love the saints. That's where he's going. You want to bury sin, endure slander, and love the saints. The people who have an allegiance to Jesus, that's what you want to be true of you. And he's going to give us each of these three topics. He's going to give us some perspective as to why, and then he's going to give us some very practical advice. So in the first section, he tells us, you want to bury sin. And you get that in verses one and two. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. He says, arm yourself. That's military language. It's a language of resistance. But he doesn't tell believers, arm yourself with weapons. He says, arm yourself with a way of thinking. I want you to have a certain perspective. I want you to have a resolve in your mind. And what's the mindset he wants us to have? The mindset is, you're done with sin. It's buried. Why? He says, because Christ suffered in the flesh. Therefore, arm yourself with that same way of thinking. Because whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So you live the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer according to human passions, but for the will of God. He says, I want you to have the same mindset Christ did. That sin was not something for him to revel in. It was something for him to bury what he's saying here at the beginning is you want to have a clean break with the sin in your life. And as he talks about it, he's talking about suffering here. Those who have suffered have ceased from sin. He's not talking about your own suffering. He's not advocating ascetic practices like we beat ourselves with whips to repent. He's not saying that. He's saying your suffering is vicarious, that Jesus Christ suffered on your behalf. And did he sin? No, he's clear in chapter 2, verse 22. Christ did not commit sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. But he says in 3.18, but Christ suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That Jesus Christ didn't sin, but, but he entered the realm of sin, rebellion against God. And Jesus entered that realm, not to revel in sin, but to destroy it. He didn't see it as something to play with. He saw it as something to bury. So he came and lived the perfect life you and I could not. And then he who knew no sin became sin on that cross that he took the penalty for our rebellion against God onto himself, and he suffered for our sin. He didn't indulge it, but he did it with a purpose. And it's, we're told earlier in 2.22, he himself bore our sin in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. That Jesus came into the realm of sin, suffered for that sin, buried it in the grave, and then he rose victorious to live a new kind of life. And that's what Peter's advocating here. You follow that same path. You follow the king. 
You don't see sin as something to revel in and enjoy. You see that Christ suffered for it and he buried it. And so you rise up with him and you live no longer according to those passions, but in new life, like Paul told the Romans, that you've been buried with Christ in baptism. It's like you went in the grave with him and you were raised from the dead so you might walk in newness of life. That he set me free from sin to live a different way. So the first thing I do is I bury everything Christ came to suffer for. It's interesting. There's a popular mindset. Uh, I remember when I was a youth pastor, I was teaching the book of Galatians to some high school kids. And you're teaching about the grace of God, that God forgives us, loves us, not because of anything we've done, because of everything Christ has done, that you can have the free gift of eternal life, peace with God, because Christ paid for all your sin. And I was telling them that story. And this kid was like, so wait a minute. You're saying that no matter what I've done, God will forgive me. Yes. And if I trust in Jesus, I'm, I'm saved and I can never lose it. I said, yes. He's like, so... I can sin all I want and he'll forgive me. And he's like, okay, great. I've got some plans on Thursday that I've been thinking about. So if he's gonna forgive me, I'm free to sin all I want? The problem with that statement is sin is not freedom. To think of sin as freedom, no, the Bible says sin is what held you captive. Jesus came to liberate you from that. So you're not free to sin. It was the poison that was killing you. See, here's the thing, and, and the passage mentioned it earlier about, uh, or as we read it earlier, drinking and sex, and as some of you maybe heard some of that language, you're like, oh, here we go. The pastor's gonna rage against alcohol and against sex and all this stuff, and we're gonna have to put on bracelets and rings and make pledges. Let me tell you something. Some of you feel that way, let me say this. God is not a killjoy. Jesus' first miracle was to make wine. God is not anti-sex. He created the equipment you use for it, okay? So God is not anti-fun, he's anti-sin. Sin is not a creator, it's a parasite. It attaches to the good and distorts it. So God isn't telling you, hey, all these good things, you can't do them anymore. He's like, no, I made you to enjoy me, to be free, and sin distorted it, it twisted it. It took good things and made them bad gods. That when God created humanity in Genesis, you see, he created them to enjoy the world and enjoy each other. But when we severed from God things we were meant to enjoy, we distorted to take advantage of each other. We took things we thought would give us liberty and they became prisons for us. And some of you know what that feels like. That you played with something you thought would be fun for you and it ended up stealing from you. And you realize sin is not freedom, sin's a cage. So I'm not gonna be liberated and forgiven so I can go back to it, that's crazy. That's like going to rehab and getting all the drugs out of your system and saying, man, you got all that poison out of my veins? Oh, thank God I'm healthy so I can fill my body up with more drugs. No! No, the whole point was to get free so you wouldn't go back so you could live a different kind of life. I remember watching the, the show, The Biggest Loser, and there was this kid that had gotten so he heavy and unhealthy that it was costing him his life. And he was a young guy in jeopardy of dying. It was kind of a last ditch effort to get him on the show. And he's eating healthy and dropping all this late weight and then the supportive structure, this change in him. And so he drops all this weight, gets a healthier life. And then he goes back home to celebrate. And his girlfriend has made him this huge cake and all these hot wings. And he's looking at him like, that's not freedom. I used to think that was freedom, but that was killing me. And she's like, oh, come on. I thought you'd want to celebrate. This is good for you. And she's guilt tripping him. And I'm like, get away from that woman yelling at the TV. <laughs> that stuff that you indulged in was taking more from you. And it's the same here. That sin was not liberty, it was a prison. And Jesus came to live the perfect life. We did not take on our sin, bury it. So when you put your faith in him, he says, hey, we live a different way. We don't live for those passions anymore. They weren't honest with us. That we have real desires in us that are distorted. And when we pursue them, it takes more than it gives. And I don't wanna live that way anymore. That's what the believer does. Says, no, I'm walking with him away from my desires towards his desires because he cares about me. These desires don't. And so I'm letting them go. Um, Augustine said it, the great saint had that famous prayer. Augustine, who knew he needed to get right with God, knew there was a God up there I have to deal with, but he didn't want to give up uh, his, his sex life. And he knew God's going to make me change some of the ways I'm treating women. And he didn't want that. So he had that famous prayer he wrote in his confessions, oh Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> but then as he wrestled with his life, all this stuff I thought would give me freedom is making me miserable 
He opened his Bible and read Romans, make mo no more provision for the flesh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he put his faith in Jesus Christ, he said on the other side of that, how wonderful it was all at once to be rid of those fruitless joys I once so feared to lose. You drove them from me and you took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure. God's not a killjoy. He's here to set you free. And so if Jesus came to bury sin, I'm gonna join it with him. I'm going with him. I'm burying it. It's part of my past, but it does not need to be a part of my present or my future. And some of you, if I'm honest, you have gone to materials and experiences to comfort you, to obliterate bad feelings, to bring some joy. You've gone to substances to give you what God is meant to. And many of us have lived like that. And the reality is there was a day for that, but he'll say later, sufficient is the past for doing what the Gentiles want to do. That kind of lifestyle is sufficient for the past. It's time to move on. Uh, with my little kids, you know, like most babies, they had pacifiers. We called them suckers. I don't know why, but you know, they're good to give them. You give them to them to what? To, to pacify them. They have some intolerable feelings they don't like. And so this thing's sort of a lifeline to help them feel better. And so you'd give it to them. But over time you realize if you persist in letting them have one, it's gonna mess up the development of their teeth. It's gonna jack up their face. Like at some point you gotta let this thing go. And so uh, we decided to do something. We came to our kids on a certain day and told them, hey, guess what? It's time. It's time to let the sucker go. It's time for the sucker to go to Sucker Island. And uh, we had a friend that had a little lake near his house that had this kind of little mound of dirt in the middle of it. And we're like, yeah, all suckers at a given time go to Sucker Island. And so we had this uh, ceremony with our kids where we rode out to Sucker Island and they, uh, they, they put it there on the beach and, you know, prayed over it, blessed it, that it would have a good life. And then we rode back and we're like, you did it. You did a hard thing. You let that go. But then we would celebrate and we threw this party and they had presents and, and they never wanted to look back. They liked this better. Uh, when my son was born, we had moved away, so we didn't have that friend, so we just um, tied the sucker to a balloon. And we're like, let it go, son. And we're like, ah, you know, and off it went. Which I laughed later. I'm like, someone's going to find that. Like, eventually, they're going to be like, why is there a balloon with a pacifier on it? They're going to be like, oh, no. Like, did a kid die? Was this just like, bye, son? And I was like, in a sense, yeah, that my old life, what used to comfort me, is now harming me. I got to let it go. And so Peter looks here and says, sin's not freedom. Sin was destroying you. Jesus came to draw the poison out of your veins. And you say, I'm going with him. Those desires led to death. His desires led to life. I'm going with him. I am going to bury my sin. Why? Because Christ buried it first. That's the perspective. He buried it. I'm going with him. Do you see it? So he says, the time is past sufficient for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Gentiles, the word ethnos means the nations. God loves the world, loves the nations. But Paul, Paul is a, or Peter is a Jew here is using that as a, as a way to talk about those who don't have a covenant with God. That God you saw in Genesis gave us food and drink and sex to enjoy in the guidelines of flourishing that he created. But the Gentiles are those who do not have a covenant with God. And when you break faith with God, you can take some good gifts and make them bad gods. And here you see the distortion, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. We're not gonna do a deep word study on all these. So I'm sorry if some of you are like, well, Ben, what is the ancient Greek for orgy? Uh, it's orgy. All right. It is what you think it is. Let's focus on the forest and not the trees. Okay. <laughs> the reality is he's talking about living in sensuality there. That's the abandoning of restraint in a pursuit of desire. That's what he's talking about. And then he aims particularly here at food and drink and sex, that, that you're abusing substances to obliterate bad feelings, to try to get good ones. But the way you're using it is destructive, not constructive. It's a severing from God and it makes these good gifts bad gods. That's why he calls it idolatry at the end. Uh, there's a great moment in the Chronicles of Narnia. I don't know if you've read those. The allegory of the Christian life, Aslan, the great lion, right, is, is they're leading these children, and uh, there, there's a great battle, and there's drama, but it's resolved. They win the day, and Aslan sets everyone free, and so they throw a party at the end, these little kids and this Christ figure, Aslan. And at the party, they're all jamming, and then while they're there with all the little fawns and unicorns and such, Bacchus shows up, the god of revelry. And he shows up to turn this party up, which is basically Bacchus's job, right? And so he comes and he brings some ladies that were kind of wow. And so they start turning this party up. And one of the little kids in this allegory was like, that guy makes me nervous. 
And he's a representation of, of parties and stuff like that in Greek literature. And her sister says, he's okay while Aslan's here, but I wouldn't want to be at a party with him if Aslan wasn't here. That you can celebrate and, and enjoy life under the lordship of Jesus. You remove fellowship with God, you take good gifts and twist them into bad gods. And much of our humanity is using sexuality and experiences in a way God never intended. We're distorting a beautiful picture. And he says the time in the past is sufficient for that. You don't need to live that way anymore. This, this numbing of your mind, this numbing of your feelings, so you can break down inhibition to do things you wouldn't do sober. That's the danger he's warning them about. And many of you know that. Many people have seen that. You looked at the history of humanity. People have often taken a variety of substances to numb their humanity, to do things they wouldn't have done sober. You see it in wartime. You see it in, in a lot of sexual violence. You see it. I, I read a book years ago about a guy watching his son get caught up in an addiction to meth. And as he's processing and he's researching meth and he's finding so much violent crime, it, it's this drug that sort of steals from people their, their humanity that allows them to do some very inhumane things. And many of you, your deepest regrets are, man, I numbed the conscience God gave me so I could do some things I thought would be life enhancing and they were life taking. And Peter says that stops now. Now, let me tell you something before we move on. Some of you, I know you hear that and you go, man, Ben, you're hammering on the people who've partied and you're hammering on the people who've maybe take their sexuality far outside of God's boundary and that's me. I'm not proud of my sexual past. What are you trying to say to me? What I'm trying to say is this. Did you notice, this is the Bible and it just mentioned the word orgy. I just don't wanna blow past that, people, because some people are like, you can't talk about that in church. Peter did. Who was this letter written to? People who were drunk at orgies. Is that how you picture the early church? Or do you picture them as sweet, pristine people that just needed to get a touch more pristine? I used a dirty word the other day and I'm sorry. Peter's like, hey guys, the drunken orgies, stop now, okay? It's enough, I'm looking at you, Bobby. Right, like he's looking at him. So if you have a past, you're welcome here. You are the target audience. And your past need not define your present or your future, right? Your past is in the past if Jesus Christ is in your present. He buried sin so you can walk in newness of life. That's how the gospel works. But if you do that, I'm going to live a different kind of life because of Jesus. Be prepared to confuse the locals. And that's point two, that you've got to endure some slander. Then he says in verse four, with respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. When your friends watch your life change because of an allegiance to God, you'll confuse them. And for many, that confusion will become slander. Uh, I had a buddy go through this. He's in his 50s, started dating again, but, but it was after he had come to faith in Christ as an older guy. And, and in that moment, he was telling me about uh, his buddies just assuming he was sleeping with this girl. And he said, no, man, and God's changing my life and, and I don't want to use her sexually. I, I want to have purity. I want to save sex for the, the covenant of marriage. I, I, I want to... To, to treat her with honor and dignity the way the Bible tells me to. And he's explaining this to his friends and they were like, what? What are you talking about? What are you, some weird religious nut now? Like, what is your deal? Nobody said, well, man, I commend you for making a responsible choice. Like his buddies were like, what's the matter with you? Y you used to dive in the flood of debauchery with us. You were the captain. You had a little hat and you would row. You used to jump in with us and it confuses them. I, I had a guy went in college, uh, came to faith in Jesus and he said, hey man, I wanna go to this party. Uh, it's at this bar to celebrate a friend. It's a special moment for them. But this is a party where I, a place where, man, I used, I used to go, wow. So can you come with me and tie me to the mast? Keep me from going crazy. I was like, yeah, of course. And I went there and his community of friends knew me as like the religious person, which is hilarious when you're already known by that in a room because no one knows how to act. They're like, would you like a... Cola, pastor to be, mm -hmm, reverend and such, and such, and you're like, oh, stop. But uh, they weren't pressuring me. But man, they were putting it on him. Are you seriously not gonna drink, bro? Come on, man, like, what's the deal? Why are you being like that? Oh, you're too good for us now? And suddenly, they're surprised that he's not diving in the flood becomes slander. What are you doing? And some of you feel that way. Some of you felt that in high school, felt that in college, feel that right now in your office. You're scared to even mention how an allegiance to God's changing your life because you know some of your coworkers will hear it as judgment and they'll slander you. How do I endure the slander? 
Well, he gives us perspective there. You realize there's a judgment bigger than theirs and it helps you endure their judgment. He says in verse five, they will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. He says, when someone's judging you and you're scared of that, keep in mind there's a bigger judgment than theirs. There is a God who will hold us all accountable for how we live. And do you notice, it's the living and the dead. That's everybody. It's not just the people who choose to believe in him. That we believe in a God who reigns over all of humanity for all time, whether you put your faith in Jesus or not. That's the a reality we believe in. Uh, I remember uh, years ago, the cartoon Tarzan came out. I remember Tarzan swinging on all these vines. And as he's doing it, uh, Phil Collins starts to sing. Just put your faith in what you most believe in. And I remember hearing that and I'm like, what? Just put your faith in whatever you believe in? That's not what Tarzan's doing. He's not like, I'm gonna grab this bird instead or I'm gonna fly now. You're like, no, he'd be splattered on the jungle floor. He's grabbing objective realities, things that will hold him up regardless of how you feel about it. And we believe there's a real God and, and we have a moral sense of oughtness because we have a moral God in the universe who created us to use our life in a certain way and he will hold us accountable for how we live. And that reality beyond the grave changes how we live now. If you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, Paul says, then eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. Who cares how you live? Who cares if you're nice or you murder? Who cares? And you might live a good life, but your philosophy doesn't warrant that per se because we all end up in the dirt. And yet here Peter says, no, we believe in life after death. We believe there's a God who gave us a gift of this life and he'll hold us accountable for how we use it. And when I think about that and then see people dishonoring him and dishonoring people who have allegiance for him, I don't get scared of them. I get worried about them. You're gonna face God and are you ready to meet him? Because there's a God who will judge both the living and the dead. And there's a comfort to that. And there's a, a compassion in that. There's a comfort in that, that he talks about the living and the dead. Why? Because there's some people, if, if you don't believe in a God like that, that there's justice beyond the grave, then you got to seek justice now. If someone hurts you, you got to hit them back or else they won't get hit. And so for many of us, we pursue vengeance uh, when someone hurts us because we go, if I don't, no one will get them. Now, I'm not saying we don't believe in justice. If someone's harmed you or uh, abused you, it's, it's right to report it, use the structures we have in, in our city and state and government wise to keep them from abusing, hurting other people. It's right to do that. But some of us, maybe the person who abused you is dead. And you go, so did they just get away with it? And this is meant to be a comfort. No, no one gets away with anything. Every sin will be accounted for, paid for, either on the cross by Jesus Christ, that perfect substitute, or by the perpetrator in judgment, in hell. That's the Bible's presentation. When you realize that, there's eternal stakes here. Suddenly, I don't worry about you being mean. I worry about you. I care about your soul. So there's a comfort. No one gets away with anything. I, I remember talking to a, a woman once who had suffered abuse, and she was at this kind of um, counseling kind of uh, 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 gathering, and, and she was telling me afterwards, she said, man, I was just wondered, does God care? Is there any justice for what happened to me? And she said, the person read from, from the Old Testament, they read from Malachi 2 and Nahum. Malachi 2 were priests that were using their religious power to exploit and hurt people. And God tells them, I hate that. And you repent or I'll judge that. And God says that I will drown you in awful. Awful with an O. He uses priestly imagery. He's talking to the priests and he's like, when they would offer a sacrifice of animals in the Old Testament, they, they would burn the meat and they would take the skin and uh, the refuse and the filth and they would burn it outside the camp. And it was called the offal. And God tells these priests who use their power to hurt people, he says, I'm gonna bury you in offal and refuse. And she said, this woman told me, does it comfort you at all to know if your perpetrator doesn't repent, God will bury them an excrement. And she said, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. So does the Christian gloat? Is that what we do? When we think about someone facing judgment, do we laugh at them and mock them? Oh, you just wait, God's gonna cut you down. Like, is that what we say? No, 
He says here, we pre- that's why the gospel was preached even to those who were dead, that not, not after they died, but before they did, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they may live in the spirit the way God does, that we want a future for them. And so he says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. When I think about someone facing the judgment of a holy God, I don't get arrogant, I get compassionate. I don't want you to face that. If I believe there's a real God out there and you're not okay, I want you to be okay. So I can pray for you. I can pray for my persecutor. That's how you can do it. That's how Jesus did it. That when he was reviled, he didn't revile back. I don't have to get vengeance. Why? Because he trusted his soul to him who judges justly. God will vindicate me. And if their sin sin stays on them, they're in trouble. So while they were murdering him, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And Stephen, the first martyr in the church, said the same thing. While they were stoning him with rocks, while they were hurting him, he says, Father, forgive them. Because he knows God will judge them and I would rather have them them have mercy than judgment. When I first started ministry, I remember I got on staff. There was very small staff. And one of the guys, uh, his wife had cheated on him with this other man and then left him. And he was telling me the story about the moment he confronted that other man. They had kind of a crazy moment where suddenly it was the two of them alone. And I was like, oh no. You know, you get all these visions in your mind of some kind of Denzel Washington movie or John Wick or something. And this guy was a big dude. He was like, yeah, so it was just me and him. And I'm like, oh no. I said, what happened? He said, I looked at him and said, I'm furious for what you've done, but God will judge you. And friend, I would rather you know the forgiveness and mercy of Jesus than know the judgment of a holy God. And I shared the gospel with him. I was like, that's crazy. (laughs) And 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. So I'm going to be sober-minded. I'm not not going to numb out on TV. I'm going to numb out in my world. I'm going to go, do I really believe in God? Do I really believe he's moral? Do I really believe we're accountable? Then you're really in trouble. So I'm praying for you, not persecuting you. I'm coming for you. I'm going to be like Abraham. There's a beautiful passage in, in Genesis where Abraham, the father of our faith, God stands him up on a mountaintop to overlook Sodom and Gomorrah. People who were indulging in a sexuality that was exploiting and hurting people. And God said, I'm coming to observe it and judge it. And in that moment, you don't see Abraham on the mountain going, well, then get him, God, get him. Hey, I'm gonna get some popcorn. This is gonna be good. What does the man of faith do when he sees impending judgment? You get this long passage in Genesis where Abraham prays for them, intercedes for them. God, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare the whole city? If there's 40 righteous, will you spare them all? If there's 30 righteous, will you spare the whole city? If there's 20 righteous, will you spare them all? If there's 10 righteous, will you spare the whole city? You see, how does the believer in God react to the non-believer as he believes judgment is coming? We have compassion, not arrogance. That I'm gonna pray for them. I'm gonna intercede for them. If I believe there's an end and will be held accountable, I'm praying for you, even if you persecute me. I I endure slander, not just because of what Christ did, but because of what's coming. How are you going to be able to do that? With some perspective, but you also need some people. And that's where he ends. How are you going to endure in a difficult day? You need to love the saints. You say, Ben, I'm going to walk with God in holiness. It might cost me some friends. It may leave me alone on some Friday nights. And it might. And some of you go, well, how am I going to endure that rejection? It's not easy to endure alone. I remember for me, right out of college, I became a youth pastor and I had random students from all these different schools and and they were coming to me because they knew I want to be right with God and I can be forgiven by Jesus. They had a real faith in God, but they would go back to their high schools and they're like, man, but, but, but the current of pressure to conform was so hard. A lot of them would just compromise their own faith. And they would feel bad about it. I'm living inconsistently, hypocritically, and and they didn't like that. And I watched them struggle, but it was just the onslaught of social pressure was too much for them as an individual. And I remember as a pastor, I'm like, I don't want all these kids to just leave here feeling shame. I'm like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, then a part of ministering to them is helping them forge a solid community. And that's where Peter goes in the end. He's talking to people who had an allegiance to Jesus in a culture and in a day where a lot of people didn't and saw it with suspicion and hostility. And he says, hey, if you're gonna be strong, we need to be strong. So you're gonna bury some sin. You're gonna endure some slander, but do it with a family. As you enter the two minute O, solidify as a team, be strong as a community, love the saints. So he says in verse eight, above all, keep loving one another earnestly 
since love covers a multitude of sins. I love that word. Earnestly means ektenos, stretched out. Jesus said it in Matthew about the end times. He says, lawlessness will increase and the love of many will grow cold. That that's where we're headed. That as people get more lawless, love will get cold. And some of you go, man, is that what's happening right now? I don't know. Some of you look at this and go, man, the end is at hand. Are we in the end times? Publishers Weekly just put out an article that said end times books have rapidly increased. And some of you go, well, wait a minute, this letter was written 2,000 years ago. So how long are we waiting for the end? Well, Peter says in 2 Peter that God is slow. One day is like a, like a thousand years. God is slow. And if you go, well, then that's stupid. Then there really is no end. Jesus said, yeah, that's what they used to say to Noah. <laughs> Judgment is coming. Don't mistake God's slowness for impotence. It's patience. It's interesting, in the days of Noah, we like to talk about Enoch. It says Enoch walked with God and God took him. God just took him away. He's like, you don't have to die. Just get up here, little buddy. It's a great story. <laughs> but you find out in Jude, kind of the sister book to Peter, that, that Enoch was a prophet. And he told that evil day in Noah's day, y'all need to repent. Judgment is coming. And then he named his son Methuselah. His name means when he dies, judgment. There's a little Bible trivia about Methuselah. Something true of him that's not true of any other human being. Do you know what it is? He's the longest living human that ever lived on the planet. Enoch saw it and says, when he dies, judgment, a flood is coming. And God lets Methuselah live much longer than any other human. Why? Because God is slow to anger, abounding in love. He doesn't want any to perish, but repent and live. And so here is the end coming, yes, but God is not slow the way we count slowness. He is patient with you. He wants people to be redeemed and rescued. And so here in these last days, as lawlessness increases and love grows cold, what will happen to most people? If you feel threatened, you shrink, you turtle up. The world's getting crazy. Let me just stockpile in my garage. Let me buy some canned goods and some guns. Let me just kind of shrink back in a difficult day. And I love Peter says, no, we love earnestly. That's the word ektenos, stretched out. The Christian doesn't shrink in, we stretch out. We move towards this community and say, I'm gonna love you earnestly because love covers a multitude of sins. And you go, what does that mean? It doesn't mean we help each other bury the bodies. It's not that kind of covering sin. He's using fire imagery. He actually gets it from Proverbs 10. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers offenses. Uh, if you want a fire to get going, you stir it up, right? You get two logs that are a little bit hot and you get them together and they and the heat bounces off each other and you just keep poking at them and poking at them and poking at them and a fire breaks out. And he says, that's what hatred's like. Hatred looks at a community and grabs little offenses. Oh, you said something that hurts my feelings? Let me think about it and dwell on it and picture it and picture my revenge. And then let me gossip to people and let me get on Twitter and let me, and then on and on it goes. And we just sort of magnify every offense to really turn up the heat on anger and division. See, Twitter, the entire internet in America. But he says, but love covers offenses. If you cover a fire, you deny it oxygen and it goes out. And he says, what does love do? It doesn't stir up every annoyance in somebody's life. Rather, it says, hey, we're all gonna get on each other's nerves. And yet, how do I focus on what's good in you? How do I see what's beautiful in you? How do I, how do I cover up the sin and how do I invest in it and help flourish what's beautiful about us? And then he moves on and the part of that loving saints, verse nine, he puts some skin on it. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality is love with skin on it. It's love that serves food. It's love that opens a home. It's love that moves towards people. It's block parties. What do we do in block parties? Someone drove a U-Haul to some parks in, in Virginia and in DC. They unloaded furniture and built living rooms out in a yard. They brought popsicles and popcorn and games and music. Why? So hundreds of you could gather together and, and make friends and maybe DC's not such a lonely place that there were some people in this church that said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show love with skin on it. I'm gonna show hospitality. That means love of stranger. I'm gonna bring in and do what the early church did. They were known to love each other before they knew each other. That how are we gonna endure a difficult day? It's by loving each other actively. And so let me do a little preaching here. This is why you get involved in church. This is why you come to church. Because all through this passage, he repeats one another, one another, one another. We're meant to care for one another. So I am not against online church. We, we have people joining us online, and I want you to know we are so glad you're here. I, I think it's wonderful because it's a good uh, entry ramp into church. A lot of people are scared to show up at a church. Like, I don't trust you people. You could be crazy. I don't want to be around you, right? 
TV safe. I can just kind of turn you on, and if you freak me out, I'll turn you off. Get out of my living room, right? But at some point, these one another's need to be worked out, and, and they're best worked out among each other. So if, if you're checking us out, you're welcome. But at some point, I want you to show up in this space because this is where this text really comes alive. We need us. We, we had Sadie and Kristen come uh, last week. Some of you were here. And, and beforehand, we do a rally with our door holders. Everyone who serves in our church, that's what we call them, door holders. We kind of rally together and, and, and we do it right down here. There's maybe a hundred so some odd people that serve every Sunday. And we just tell stories of what God's done in our life. And, and G, we call them Jesus stories. Here's what Jesus did in my friend's life, in my life. And it just kind of encourages us. And then we pray for all of you. And then we break and go to our spots to serve as you come in and, and we practice hospitality. And so they just wanted to show up early. They were sitting in that circle and and uh, whoever was hosting it said, hey, let's, we're going to tell some Jesus stories. And someone from production grabs the mic. Now, if you're not familiar with production circles, people that wear all black, wear the headphones and kind of run cameras and soundboards, out in the world, production people have a bit of a reputation for being a surly bunch. And they have to stay up late and wake up early and, and they never have quite as much gear as they want and, and then the, the talent's so demanding, oh, they need a certain kind of mic and let me unscrew the water for you. And, and there's always kind of this animosity with sort of the, the salty dogs in the production community. And so we're there and suddenly a production person grabs the mic and was like, hey, I just want to praise God because my car broke down and I wasn't even sure how, how I was going to get here. And, and, but we were with our production team and we were sharing prayer requests because we pray for each other. And I said, y'all pray for me. My car broke down. I'm having trouble getting it fixed. I'm trying to figure that out. And someone says, man, I'll pray for you, but I have an extra car. You're like, who has an extra car in DC or in life? And he's like, here's the keys. And she's like, so I'm here because he gave me a car. And he's like, I was happy to do it. And you're like, wait, what? And on and on it went like that. Someone else was like, man, I lost my job. Wasn't sure where I was going to live. These guys moved me in, helped me prepare for an interview. I got a job. And everyone's like, what? And I remember at one point, Christian looked over me and goes, what is happening? He's like, is this church? And I was like, well, yes, it is. But these are just the people who are about to serve as we let other people in the room. But yeah, it's kind of like doing church. And he was like, these are just volunteers? These are your volunteers? I was like, well, this is just some of them. These are just the ones serving today. He was like, this is crazy. And so when he got on stage, I don't know if you heard it, when he got up here, he was like, I would go to this church. And I was like, yeah, me too. I say that all the time, that I would go here because we, we're doing this. This hospitality, love with skin on it is so encouraging as the world grows cold, we got a fire to gather around. That I got a hospitality without grumbling. I love that. The word grumbling in Greek is a, Onomatopoeia, those are words that sound like what they are, like bam or pow. Uh, grumbling in Greek is gongunzo. <laughs> no one wants you to serve here and like, welcome to church, gongunzo. Like that's not very special. But if they see a sincere love, that's powerful. I was talking to a brother outside the other day at the end of church, came out there and he's like, hey man, I've been tracking with y'all online for a while now. And I'm like, that's awesome. You are so welcome and I love it. And he's like, yeah, but it's different being in the room. I said, how is that? He's like, well, all these people greeting us on the way in, greeting me, greeting my kids. He's like, standing here talking to you. You're not just some dude on my screen. Like, like you know me now. You know my kid. I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is doing community together, doing the one another's. And I just want to challenge you. If, if you're tracking with us online, that's fantastic. But I want to encourage you. Man, God has given us a gift called us. And then here at the end, he's given gifts to all of us for the sake of us. He says, as we wrap up here, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's various grace. A steward is someone who's been in charge of something they don't own. And he says, I took my empowering grace and I gave it to all of you. At one point, I'll take it back, but I gave it to you, why? For building up an us. It's like God has this beautiful picture of a church and he made it a puzzle and he crumbled up the pieces and handed each one of us a piece. And if you don't jump in and get involved either here or somewhere, it's like you're withholding a piece. The picture is just not complete. How good at basketball is LeBron James' fingernail. It's amazing. Grips that ball, lifts it high over the net, drills it down. What, a, what an amazing fingernail. To the degree that it's connected to his finger and his hand and his arm and those massive shoulders. It, its significance is directly tied to its part of being a part of a bigger story, a bigger community, a bigger body. And God's made us a body of Christ and, and you have gifts to use, but your greatest significance in life will come through serving with us. It's interesting. People ask God to empower them all the time. 
uh, empower them to serve, empower them to do things. Here he says the power of God moves towards those, what? Who are serving. You want to feel the power of God in your life? You want to feel like my life has a bigger story? Here's where it is. God empowers those who serve. So, he says, so if you're a preacher like me, he says, preach the oracles of God. I'm not standing up here telling you what Ben thinks. I'm trying to explain to you what this word says. And he says, if you serve, serve with the strength God provides, that God wants to empower serving. Why? So that God will get the glory, that people will be repelled by your holiness, but drawn by your love. That's how the world works. That when you abstain from certain desires, they'll malign you. But when they see how loving your community is, they'll say, but you have something and I want that. And so all I'm trying to do here is tell you, man, before the clock runs out, get in this game. Get rid of that which was holding you back. Endure the opposition and then run in the paths God's created for you to run and take the gifts he gave you and use it to serve us. When my wife and I moved up here, we left College Station, Texas, where I served, farmer's side, where I served among Texas A&M, number one recruiting class this year for our football team. This is our year. Here we come. <laughs> and uh, that was hard to do because I used to go to every single football game and I'd do chapels for the teams, that sort of thing. But I decided as I moved to D.C., I'm going to go back and do one game a year, one chapel a year, and stay tethered to the boys. And uh, I got to tell you something. As someone who gets to do chapels, it's awesome being in the stands. I mean, A&M, we have this thing called the 12th man. And it's this whole symbolism of like, there's 11 men on the field, but I'm the 12th man. So if you need me, I'll, I'll come running in out of the stands. They never quite need you, but, but it's, 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 a, it's a state of mind. And so you stand the whole game like, go ahead and put me in coach, you know? And, uh, and that's pretty cool. But then when I do chapels, they let me stand on the field. And that's a totally different energy. When you're down there, you hear the roar of the crowd, but you also hear the huddle. You, you see the sweat fly off people when they catch a ball. Like, like I've had people catch a ball and fall out of the sidelines. And I'm like, ah, you know, catching these massive men that are 19. And it's just like unbelievable to be there. There's a totally different energy. You're like, this is crazy. This is nuts. I'm right down in it. I feel so privileged. People are texting me. Is that you on the sidelines? Yeah, that's me, bro. You know, it's like so awesome. But then I played football in high school for two beautiful years before I broke my femur. And it's a different energy being on the field where now I get to affect outcomes. I get to band together with a group of people. I get to block so you can move. I get to tackle to stop that. I get to catch a ball and maybe score a goal. That's a totally different energy. And what I'm saying here is Peter says, hey, th this game is going someplace and the clock will run out. So disentangle from what's holding you back. That sin wasn't freedom, it's slavery and Christ has set you free. You're gonna endure some opposition if you choose to run with him, but you don't let that bother you. There's a judgment higher than theirs, and that gives you the ability to not judge them, but to be compassionate. But there's a game being played. The Spirit of God is empowering the people of God to extend grace to each other so that when the world sees us love one another, they'll respond the way my friend did. What is this? This is church? I would go here they see you love the saints and they say, I want to gather around that same fire. They see us caring for each other as the world gets cold. We have a white hot love for one another. Where does that come from? Well, we follow a hero. Well, oh, I want to follow him too. I want glory and dominion to go to Jesus because to him all praise is due. While we were in the stands, he lived the perfect life for us. He died for our sin. He buried it. He rose. So if you put your faith in him, you have made something else free to join the game. And that's our hope for you, that you can go running into the sunrise and saying, in the last days, I was doing exactly what I wanted to be doing when I saw his face.